Chapter 66 The Death of Saul Again war was declared between Israel and the Philistines. The Philistines gathered themselves together, and came and pitched in Shunem, on the northern edge of the plain of Jezreel, while Saul and his forces encamped but a few miles distant at the foot of Mount Gilboa, on the southern border of the plain. It was on this plain that Gideon, with three hundred men, had put to flight the hosts of Midian. But the spirit that inspired Israel's deliverer was widely different from that which now stirred the heart of the king. Gideon went forth strong in faith in the mighty God of Jacob, but Saul felt himself to be alone and defenseless, because God had forsaken him. As he looked abroad upon the Philistine host, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. Saul had learned that David and his force were with the Philistines, and he expected that the son of Jesse would take this opportunity to revenge the wrongs he had suffered. The king was in sore distress. It was his own unreasoning passion, spurring him on to destroy the chosen of God, that had involved the nation in so great peril. While he had been engrossed in pursuing David, he had neglected the defense of his kingdom. The Philistines, taking advantage of its unguarded condition, had penetrated into the very heart of the country. Thus, while Satan had been urging Saul to employ every energy in hunting David, that he might destroy him, the same malignant spirit had inspired the Philistines to seize their opportunity to work Saul's ruin and overthrow the people of God. How often is the same policy still employed by the archenemy? He moves upon some unconsecrated heart to kindle envy and strife in the church, and then, taking advantage of the divided condition of God's people, he stirs up his agents to work their ruin. On the morrow Saul must engage the Philistines in battle. The shadows of impending doom gathered dark about him. He longed for help and guidance. But it was in vain that he sought counsel from God. The Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. The Lord never turned away a soul that came to him in sincerity and humility. Why did he turn Saul away unanswered? The king had by his own act forfeited the benefits of all the methods of inquiring of God. He had rejected the counsel of Samuel the prophet. He had exiled David, the chosen of God. He had slain the priests of the Lord. Could he expect to be answered by God when he had cut off the channels of communication that heaven had ordained? He had sinned away the spirit of grace. And could he be answered by dreams and revelations from the Lord? Saul did not turn to God with humility and repentance. It was not pardon for sin and reconciliation with God that he sought, but deliverance from his foes. By his own stubbornness and rebellion, he had cut himself off from God. There could be no return but by the way of penitence and contrition. But the proud monarch, in his anguish and despair, determined to seek help from another source. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. Saul had a full knowledge of the character of necromancy. It had been expressly forbidden by the Lord, and the sentence of death was pronounced against all who practiced its unholy arts. During the life of Samuel, Saul had commanded that all wizards and those that had familiar spirits should be put to death. But now, in the rashness of desperation, he had recourse to that oracle which he had condemned as an abomination. It was told the king that a woman who had a familiar spirit was living in concealment at Endor. This woman had entered into covenant with Satan to yield herself to his control, 
to fulfill his purposes. And in return, the prince of evil wrought wonders for her and revealed secret things to her. Disguising himself, Saul went forth by night with but two attendants to seek the retreat of the sorceress. O oh, pitiable sight! The king of Israel led captive by Satan at his will. What path so dark for human feet to tread as that chosen by one who has persisted in having his own way, resisting the holy influences of the Spirit of God? What bondage so terrible as that of him who is given over to the control of the worst of tyrants, himself? Trust in God and obedience to his will were the only conditions upon which Saul could be king of Israel. Had he complied with these conditions throughout his reign, his kingdom would have been secure. God would have been his guide, the omnipotent his shield. God had borne long with Saul, and although his rebellion and obstinacy had well-nigh silenced the divine voice in the soul, there was still opportunity for repentance. But when in his peril he turned from God to obtain light from a confederate of Satan, he had cut the last tie that bound him to his Maker. He had placed himself fully under the control of that demoniac power which for years had been exercised upon him, and which had brought him to the verge of destruction. Under the cover of darkness, Saul and his attendants made their way across the plain, and safely passing the Philistine host, they crossed the mountain ridge to the lonely home of the sorceress of Endor. Here the woman with a familiar spirit had hidden herself away that she might secretly continue her profane incantations. Disguised as he was, Saul's lofty stature and kingly port declared that he was no common soldier. The woman suspected that her visitor was Saul, and his rich gifts strengthened her suspicions. To his request, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee, the woman answered, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? Then Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And when she said, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? He answered, Samuel. After practicing her incantations, she said, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. It was not God's holy prophet that came forth at the spell of a sorcerer's incantation. Samuel was not present in that haunt of evil spirits. That supernatural appearance was produced solely by the power of Satan. He could as easily assume the form of Samuel as he could assume that of an angel of light when he tempted Christ in the wilderness. The woman's first words under the spell of her incantation had been addressed to the king, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Thus the first act of the evil spirit which personated the prophet was to communicate secretly with this wicked woman, to warn her of the deception that had been practiced upon her. The message to Saul from the pretended prophet was, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. When Samuel was living, 
Saul had despised his counsel and had resented his reproofs. But now, in the hour of his distress and calamity, he felt that the prophet's guidance was his only hope, and in order to communicate with heaven's ambassador, he vainly had recourse to the messenger of hell. Saul had placed himself fully in the power of Satan, and now he whose only delight is in causing misery and destruction made the most of his advantage to work the ruin of the unhappy king. In answer to Saul's agonized entreaty came the terrible message, professedly from the lips of Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. All through his course of rebellion Saul had been flattered and deceived by Satan. It is the tempter's work to belittle sin, to make the path of transgression easy and inviting, to blind the mind to the warnings and threatenings of the Lord. Satan, by his bewitching power, had led Saul to justify himself in defiance of Samuel's reproofs and warning. But now, in his extremity, he turned upon him, presenting the enormity of his sin and the hopelessness of pardon, that he might goad him to desperation. Nothing could have been better chosen to destroy his courage and confuse his judgment, or to drive him to despair and self-destruction. Saul was faint with weariness and fasting. He was terrified and conscience-stricken. As the fearful prediction fell upon his ear, his form swayed like an oak before the tempest, and he fell prostrate to the earth. The sorceress was filled with alarm. The king of Israel lay before her like one dead. Should he perish in her retreat, what would be the consequences to herself? She besought him to arise and partake of food, urging that since she had imperiled her life in granting his desire, he should yield to her request for the preservation of his own. His servants joining their entreaties, Saul yielded at last, and the woman set before him the fatted calf and unleavened bread hastily prepared. What a scene! In the wild cave of the sorceress, which but a little before had echoed with the words of doom, in the presence of Satan's messenger, he, who had been anointed of God as king over Israel, sat down to eat in preparation for the day's deadly strife. Before the break of day he returned with his attendants to the camp of Israel to make ready for the conflict. By consulting that spirit of darkness, Saul had destroyed himself. Oppressed by the horror of despair, it would be impossible for him to inspire his army with courage. Separated from the source of strength, he could not lead the minds of Israel to look to God as their helper. Thus, the prediction of evil would work its own accomplishment. On the plain of Shunem, and the slopes of Mount Gilboa, the armies of Israel and the hosts of the Philistines closed in mortal combat. Though the fearful scene in the cave of Endor had driven all hope from his heart, Saul fought with desperate valor for his throne and his kingdom. But it was in vain. The men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. Three brave sons of the king died at his side. The archers pressed upon Saul. He had seen his soldiers falling around him, and his princely sons cut down by the sword. Himself wounded, he could neither fight nor fly. 
escape was impossible, and determined not to be taken alive by the Philistines, he bade his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith. When the man refused to lift his hand against the Lord's anointed, Saul took his own life by falling upon his sword. Thus the first king of Israel perished with the guilt of self-murder upon his soul. His life had been a failure, and he went down in dishonor and despair, because he had set up his own perverse will against the will of God. The tidings of defeat spread far and wide, carrying terror to all Israel. The people fled from the cities, and the Philistines took undisturbed possession. Saul's reign, independent of God, had well nigh proved the ruin of his people. On the day following the engagement, the Philistines, searching the battlefield to rob the slain, discovered the bodies of Saul and his three sons. To complete their triumph, they cut off the head of Saul and stripped him of his armor. Then the head and the armor, reeking with blood, were sent to the country of the Philistines as a trophy of victory to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. The armor was finally put in the house of Ashtaroth, while the head was fastened in the temple of Dagon. Thus the glory of the victory was ascribed to the power of these false gods, and the name of Jehovah was dishonored. The dead bodies of Saul and his sons were dragged to Beth Shan, a city not far from Gilboa, and near the river Jordan. Here they were hung up in chains to be devoured by birds of prey. But the brave men of Jabesh Gilead, remembering Saul's deliverance of their city in his earlier and happier years, now manifested their gratitude by rescuing the bodies of the king and princes and giving them honorable burial. Crossing the Jordan by night, they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and came to Jabesh and burnt them there, and they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh, and fasted seven days. Thus the noble deed performed forty years before, secured for Saul and his sons burial by tender and pitying hands in that dark hour of defeat and dishonor.